Thank you so much. It's good to be here today. I, uh, yeah, I've known Scott now for I don't know how long, but uh, it's all been good, and I am happy to be here with you today. Uh, it, you remind me, I, I pastored a congregation up in Tombaugh uh, for about 15 years that was very similar to your group, and so this feels like home to me. So thank you for being here, and I'm glad to be here and glad to be a part of this with you. Uh, also, uh, just being back over in Old Town Spring, uh, how many of you were born in uh, uh, after 1982? Yeah, that's what I figured. About half the crowd. Yeah. Yeah. In, in 1982, uh, I was barely out of college, and I got called to become the youth pastor at Spring Baptist Church which is just up the street. Yeah. Yeah. And I was the youth pastor there for four years from 1982 to 1986. And uh, it was, uh, we had a really good ministry there. And it also was one of the hardest times uh, in my life, just for a lot of reasons. Uh, I was scared to death of my pastor. I was. I was he was kind of an intimidating sort of guy, and uh, when he got angry, he kind of, uh, you know, everybody knew he was angry, and uh, my dad had been kind of like that, and so, man, I didn't want anything to do with him, so I kept my mouth shut, Kirby. I didn't say anything. I said, yes, sir, no, sir, did exactly what he wanted me to do, because I was completely intimidated by him. And uh, and the truth is, I didn't show up fully as me. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I was scared to show up fully as me. I had some thoughts, I had some opinions, I had some ideas, but I was afraid to offer them. So after four years, uh, and and really quite unexpectedly, I was uh, invited to to uh, move to 1960. Long move, and. Uh, <laughs> There was a little church uh, that was meeting in a in a strip shopping center uh, up on 1960, and they invited me to come be their pastor. So I went from being youth pastor to being a pastor, and I'm still in my 20s. So, like, yeah, like I was so far over my head, I didn't even know it. <laughs> and uh, But I started pastoring this church, and here's what I thought. I thought, okay, guess what? Now I get to be the one in charge. Now I get to tell everybody what to do, and uh, and I and I swore to myself that I would never treat anybody the way my pastor had treated me, and really the way my father had treated me when I was a kid. That I, that just yeah, that I would never do that. And for the first couple of years of pastoring that church, I did that really well. I mean, I am a I, I am. At heart, a nice guy, easy to get along with, easygoing, flexible, and all went really well until one Sunday morning. And uh, my roots are Baptist, and so uh, we were back in that day in the '80s. We were more traditional, and uh, and so we had Sunday school, and we had a guy that was over the Sunday school called our Sunday school director. And I'll never forget one Sunday. Uh, it was it was at the end of Sunday school and before the worship service was was about to start. This guy kind of backed me in the corner of the Sunday school office and started getting in my face and telling me about all the things he didn't like about what I was doing. And I don't know what happened, but it was like a switch flipped in me. Because you know what I saw? What I saw was my dad in my face shaking his finger at me. And... I swore I'd never treat anybody like that, like the way my father treated me. But when that when that switch, when I got triggered, guess who showed up? My dad showed up, and I and I just verbally sliced and diced this guy. Because what I also discovered about myself was, first of all, I said I'm never going to treat anybody the way I was treated. But then I also deep inside said, and by God, I'm never going to let anybody treat me that way ever again. 
And here was this guy shaking his finger in my face, and, and, and I showed up in a way I didn't want to show up as. And guess what? I spewed all over him. He left mad. I left mad. Of course, in about ten minutes, I was supposed to be filled with the Holy Spirit speaking in the, in the worship service, right? You know, oh, hallelujah, you know, praise Jesus, I'm preaching. And, uh, but, but I have to tell you, here's what happened. I, uh, after that event, I, I just said, how in the world could you behave that way? I mean, that was ugly. And I repledged, I'll never do it again. How many of you think I never did it again? <laughs> yeah, every time I got triggered like that, every time somebody showed up that, that reminded me of my father, I would, I would behave in exactly the same way. And I didn't know it then. I wasn't aware of any of this then. I didn't know what was going on back then. But, but here's what I discovered. And, and this is what I believe. I believe every one of us have wounds from our first formation, our families that we grew up in, that develop as triggers in us. And when that trigger gets triggered, or that we might you might call it a button gets pushed. When my buttons get pushed, guess what? I show up in a way that's not the way that I want to show up as. And I show up in a way that is inconsistent with the way of Jesus. That's the most important thing. I want to be a follower of Jesus. I want to look like Jesus. I want to live my life the way Jesus would live my life if Jesus was me. And when that button got pushed or that trigger got triggered, I showed up in ways that weren't like Jesus. And I was totally unaware of what any of that was about. I rocked along. I pastored that church for 13 and a half years. And we had a lot of really good outward success. I mean, church grew. Uh, yeah, just a lot of really nice outward success things. And after 13 and a half years, I burnt out at 42 years of age. And what I burnt out around was my buttons and my triggers that I wasn't aware of and all of that stuff that just kept showing up over and over again in my life. So I committed at somewhere along the way, I'm going to find out what this is about and I'm going to get healed and I'm going to get whole. And, uh, and, and I have. And that's been part of my journey. So today, I want to take you to a place in Scripture where we find a really similar story. Okay, It's Luke chapter 9, and it's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Uh, it's one you probably have never heard a sermon on before. But uh, Luke 9, beginning in verse 51, and I am going to read from a new translation called the Voice Translation. Any of you all familiar with the Voice? Uh, the Voice was done here a couple of years ago, a few years ago, and several of my friends uh, contributed to it. So I really like it, and I'm just going to read from it today, okay? So it may sound a little different than what you have. The time approached for Jesus to be taken back up to the Father. So strong with resolve, Jesus made Jerusalem his destination. He sent some people ahead of him into the territory of the Samaritans, which were a minority group at odds with the Jewish majority. He wanted his messengers to find a place for them to stay in a village along the, uh, the road to Jerusalem. But because the Samaritans realized Jesus was going to Jerusalem, they refused to welcome them. James and John, when they heard about it, were outraged. And they turned to Jesus and said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy these people who have rejected you? Just like Elijah did. And Jesus looked at them and said, you just don't get it. The Son of Man didn't come to ruin the lives of people. He came to liberate them. And Jesus led them on to another village. So, interesting little text uh, that, I, that I love. Uh, the first part of it, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk about it just a little bit, but the first part of it is this. Jesus, first of all, was committed to go to Jerusalem. 
Okay, so in some of the translations, and it may have been in your translation, it says Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. Now that that's not a, a phrase that we're familiar with because it's a Jewish phrase. And what it means is Jesus gave his word to go to Jerusalem. Now, here's a little background in the story that I want you to get. Jesus had been up around the Sea of Galilee, which is in the northern part of the country. And Jesus had been ministering up in the northern part. And here's the thing. Jesus was having great success. Man, crowds were following Him. People were being touched and lives were being made whole and people were being healed of diseases and demons were being cast out. And all sorts of people were following Him and all sorts of good things were happening. And it was, it was probably the, the best moment in the ministry of Jesus was up around Galilee. But Galilee wasn't the end of the story. Because as you know, and as I know, uh, there was a crucifixion coming. And there's a resurrection coming. And all that stuff. And so when, when Jesus set His face to go to Jerusalem, what He was doing was saying, I am committed to everything that's in front of me. And it marked a significant transition in his ministry. From all the good times of Galilee, now he's going to face hard times. And so here's what he knows is going to happen. What he knows is going to happen is he's going to be rejected by some of his followers. Now, I don't know about you, but one of the, one of the worst things in the world is when a follower quits following. You know, I, I, maybe you've experienced... Uh, experienced it here if somebody starts coming to your church and then one day they just don't show back up and they decided they're going to go to another church somewhere. I mean, somehow we just take that personally, don't we? Well, Jesus knew some of His followers were going to turn their back on Him. Jesus knew that His own family weren't going to, were going to turn their back on Him. Jesus knew that the religious leaders down in Jerusalem, they were going to turn their backs on Him. And Jesus anticipated that he was going to be executed. And in spite of all of that, he said, I'm going to Jerusalem. Because that's what I'm called to do. One of the things that I, I, I want to just flesh out with you for a moment is this, is that all of us naturally want to stay comfortable. Right? Don't you want to stay comfortable? I, I, man, I, I want everything to go smooth and I want everything to be good and I want everybody to like me and I want all good things to happen and I don't, I don't want any bad in my life and I certainly don't want to look at the bad deep within me. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to go there. I'm afraid to go there. And what I want to invite you to notice is the example of Jesus. In spite of his fear, he set his face to Jerusalem. One of the things that I believe about being a follower of Jesus is that Jesus set the example for us to follow by being courageous. And then he invites us to be courageous. Because as followers of Jesus, this is what I believe, Jesus will regularly invite us to get out of our comfort zone. He will regularly stretch us in ways we don't want to be stretched, right? I mean, He regularly will put stuff right here in our face and say, here it is, and I don't want to see it. But Jesus is the example of facing our fears with courage. But as disciples, here's what happened. Then Jesus said, and now let me teach you how to go where I'm going to go. And so Jesus said, we're going to Jerusalem, and the way we're going to get there is through Samaria. Now, I don't know how many of you know any biblical history or any of the, the account of the animosity that existed between the Jews and the Samaritans, but it was huge, and it was deep, and it was hundreds of years long. I can barely get over what happened to me yesterday. <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? And, and, and here's hundreds of years of animosity. And here's what would happen. 
often the Jews up in Galilee, so Jerusalem was in the south, Galilee was in the north, and Samaria was right between the two. And so often when the Jewish people would head to Galilee or from Galilee down to Jerusalem, they, would, they wouldn't even go through Samaria. They'd just avoid it. They'd just say, you know what, I'm just going to not go there. I, I'm so afraid of those people. I'm so, you know, and some bad things had happened along the way. That they'd go out of their way. But when Jesus decides we're going back to Jerusalem, guess what Jesus says we're going to do? We're going to go right through Samaria. In other words, what Jesus was saying is, in order for you to be healed and whole as my disciple, you're going to have to confront what you didn't want to confront. Here we go through, Jerusalem, through uh, Samaria. So can you imagine that you and I decide we want to go to Dallas? Well, everybody in this room knows the best way to Dallas, right? Jump right out here on I-45, baby. Two and a half hours. Boom. For you, it's probably two hours, right? Yeah, that's what I figured. Yeah. Two-hour drive. We're there. Well, uh, imagine if there were a group of people that lived in Madisonville and Centerville and Buffalo that we hated. That we had years of animosity toward, that we'd gotten in fights with before, that, you know, bad things had happened. Man, we, there's all sorts of stories about people who'd driven through Madisonville and, you know, got hurt. And, and, and so in order to avoid that territory, in order to get to Dallas, we'd go to Austin and hit I-35 in Austin and get to Dallas through Austin. That just doesn't make sense, right? Well, that's what the Jews would often do. They'd go that far out of their way just to avoid a certain group of people. Amazing, right? Isn't it amazing how far we will go to avoid being confronted with what we don't want to be confronted with? Isn't it amazing what we do uh, when we just don't like people? How much we'll avoid them. Keep away from them. I mean, we'll drive four miles, 1,400 miles out of the way so we don't have to confront them. And, and so I want you to feel that in this story because Jesus confronted that with His disciples and said, you know what? We're going through Samaria. Well, back in that day and time, they didn't have Motel 6 to keep the light on for you, right? And, and so when, when people traveled and recognized when Jesus, He had an entourage now, I don't know how many, but at least 30, 35 people were traveling with Him, maybe even more than that, and recognized they walked. I mean, I can't even imagine that. Can you? I mean, so we're going to Dallas and we're walking. <laughs> no, I think I'll just stay. Well, so... So they head out towards Samaria, and, uh, and, and one of the things that Jesus does, the first thing He does is to say, okay, we're not going to get to Jerusalem overnight, and so we need to send a couple of disciples out in front of us, and they will arrange lodging for us. And here's what the lodging was. The lodging was the hospitality of the people in the town that they went through. That was the culture of their day. Okay, so, so people just welcomed strangers into their home who were, who were travelers. That's just the way it was done. And so Jesus said, well, that's just the way it's done. And, and I want you, you couple of guys, it looks like you know we'll be up here in Conroe by tonight. And so I want you to go up to Conroe and I want you to see if there's some people up in Conroe who will open their house to us. It's the normal thing to do. Well, these disciples go up there and, and they knock on a few doors. And what they hear is that Jesus is going to Jerusalem. Now, the significance of that is religious. Okay, so there was one of the arguments and one of the big differences between the Samaritans and the Jews was where's the proper place to worship and what's the proper way to worship. And Jerusalem symbolized the, the proper way for the Jews. And so when they heard Jesus was going to Jerusalem, all of their own religious prejudice came up. And they said, no way. You ain't staying here. Uh-uh. Now, they had every right to do that. It's their house. 
They could say no, right? So they say no, and the disciples come back to Jesus and the other group, the other 35, 50, however many it is. And they say to Jesus, we, you know, we went to Conroe and we couldn't, we couldn't find anybody in Conroe that welcomed us. And for whatever reason, I, I won't use the word I normally use, but that really upset James and John. You know what it did? Yeah, it upset them. It upset them. And, uh, and, and I don't, but, but you know what I think? I think they got triggered. I, I think they got their button pushed somehow. You don't tell us no. And then they turned to Jesus. And can you imagine now? They'd been up with Jesus for a couple, for I don't know how long, but they'd been up around the Sea of Galilee and all sorts of really amazing things were happening. Lives were being transformed. I mean, can you imagine just seeing people's lives being made whole and all sorts of good things happening? And then when we go to Samaria, this group up in Conroe tells us, no, you can't stay here. And James and John look at Jesus and say, well, do you want us just to call fire down from heaven and blow these people off the face of the map? <laughs> I mean, first of all, come on, James and John. How in the world do you think you're going to call fire down from heaven? Right? I mean, they hadn't done anything. But now they're going to call fire down from heaven. I, I don't, you know, I don't know where they get off with that. But somehow, it, now, here's what I'm certain of. I'm certain none of you have ever wished God would just zap somebody dead and take them off the face of the earth. Right? Nobody in here has ever done that. Right? Never. Uh-uh. Exactly. Never. Right. Yeah, you, you know, it, it's amazing at how anti-Christ we can, we can get when we get triggered. Right? I mean, because Jesus is about life and love and, and peace and joy and all of those good things in life. But buddy, when we get mad at somebody, yeah, I just assume, God, you just throw a lightning bolt down. I know you can throw one down. Now, here's the interesting things about James and John. Some of y'all may know this uh, from your Bible studies, but James and John are known, were known, they had a nickname. They were known as the Sons of Thunder. The Sons of Thunder. Okay, so they're the sons of thunder. That meant their daddy's name was Thunder. That was his nickname. They might have had the same dad I did. I don't know, right? <laughs> Any of y'all can recognize or uh, uh, appreciate uh, a dad who's called Thunder? Yeah, my dad thundered on me from time to time. It, it's no wonder they wanted to throw lightning bolts. You know? Uh, so here, here's the thing I, I want you to see in this text is I believe James and John reacted the way they reacted because they had buttons and triggers that, that started back with their dad at home. See, I don't think it was really about the Samaritans at all. The Samaritans were just the people that showed up that day, that got in the way, that triggered what was deep within James and John. And what was deep within James and John was, was something that needed to be healed and they, weren't, they didn't even know what it was. And so Jesus just simply turns to them and says, you guys don't get it. That's not who I am. It's not what I'm about. I'm not about destroying people's lives. I'm about liberating people from the things that have them in bondage. I'm about life. Folks, here's my point today. My point today is this. I believe every one of us have wounds from our past that we that, that are still going on in our lives. And, and what happens is periodically we get triggered and, and an ugly version of us shows up. A version of us that doesn't look anything like Jesus shows up. And what we need to do 
I believe, is have the courage to be able to confront whatever that is and get healing from it. Because I believe that's what Jesus came to do. And what I'd love to do is be able to say, and all you need to do is pray, and God will deliver you from that. But that doesn't seem the way God works. What seems to be the way God works is God says, I'll help you uncover it, but you've got to have the courage to face it. I have a good friend that uses this metaphor for what I'm talking about. She talks about uh, having a sore in our arm where we get a little shard of, of glass in our arm. You ever got a little glass or maybe a splinter in your arm? And, and you get it, and, and, and when it goes in, man, it, it hurts, and, and it gets a little infection, and you don't really do anything about it. Maybe put a little Band-Aid over it. You just leave it. No big problem. Doesn't really hurt that much. And you just start living with it. And it kind of scabs over. And then maybe the maybe even one day the, the skin grows over it. But that little piece of glass is still there. And then along life's journey, you're at the mall one day or you're out here shopping one day or you're somewhere. Maybe you're at home with your spouse or, or with the person you're dating or that you love. And, and you bump into them with your shoulder. And all of a sudden, that shard of glass cuts again. And what do you do? <laughs> and who do you get mad at? You get, you get mad at the person you bumped into, don't you? And you say, well, what in the world are you bumping into me for? When the reality is, it's not the person that bumps into you that has the problem. It's you that's got the problem. And so here's my point. We are responsible. Not, we're not the cause of our wounding, but we're, we're responsible to get healing from our wounding. Nobody else can do that for us. And what we tend to do is spend all of our lives pointing a finger and blaming, oh, it's my wife, or it's my husband, or it's my boyfriend, or girlfriend, it's my parents, it's my teacher. Granted, they may have done some things that weren't the best. But the truth is, as adults, we're responsible for what goes on in us now. And we're responsible for that. Reason. So, Scott told you, uh, I'm, I'm the executive director of a ministry called Faith Walking. In Faith Walking, what we do is we help people find healing around those wounds. Uh, that's exactly what we do. We're not the only group that can do that. Uh, maybe you can find it in a counselor. Maybe you can find it in a support group somewhere. But here's what I believe, folks, deeply. What I believe deeply is that, that the church in America is in trouble. And we're in trouble because our testimony is not very good. Because we appear angry and we appear hateful and we appear like we just want to blow some people off the face of the earth. That's the way we appear. And I believe what God is saying to us is, that's not my way. My way is the way of love. And the only way you can that love is when you get rid of those wounds that keep you triggered. So I want to invite you to find a way to get rid of those wounds because here's what I believe. I believe there is great hope in Jesus. Wherever you're hopeless. See, I was hopeless and thinking I'll never change. But you know something? I have changed. And, I, and I'm continuing to change. It's an ongoing journey because God's at work in my life. I appreciate you having me today, and I appreciate you listening. Let's pray together, would you?